Thanks very much. Okay, hi, I'm Joanna White. I am collections and information developer at the BFI National Archive. Oh, let me just get rid of my little... Yeah. Um, it's a real joy to give a first presentation at No Time To Wait this year. This conference has been such an inspiration for me. I'd like to give a quick overview of how we're using Royal Cooked at the BFI. First, our Heritage 2022 film digitization project, and then more latterly, our BFI scanning workflows. So our Heritage 2022 film digitization project is preserving three petabytes. That's three, I'm a bit ahead of myself, three million gigabytes of legacy DPX film scans currently held on LTO data tape. This data is retrieved from LTO tape for us by an external agency and copied to Isolon clustered network access storage, approximately 400 items at a time. Each item includes DPX sequences, ProRes, MOVs, and WAV files. The MOV and WAV files are validated and moved immediately into our digital preservation infrastructure, which we call DPI. Uh, the DPX sequences are also validated and passed on to our preservation workflow. So the Heritage 2022 film digitization project identified one primary focus, digital preservation using a lossless open standards-based format that is increasingly adopted by public archives around the world. Raw Cooked was created, created by Jerome Martinez, who you just heard from, and his team at Media Area was chosen to encode the DPX sequences to FFV1 video codec in a Matroska container. This codec offers amazing features for audiovisual preservation, including large file size reductions, frame slices that improve multi-threading playback performance, and slice CRCs or cyclic redundancy checks that make it possible for a decoder to detect bitstream errors. Raw currently encodes to FFV1 using open source FFmpeg program and libraries, while reversibility processes are produced by Media Area. To show you how it works, Raw Cook takes an image sequence folder and easily encodes it into a single video stream. Using the all command ensures the highest standard of image sequence encoding by combining key preservation flags. Here you can see it, analyzing the DPX sequence counting from zero through to 100% before launching the FFmpeg encoding. Any second now. Once the Matroska has been created, the file is checked again um, against embedded hashes in the raw cook reversibility data and the quality of the FFE1 Matroska is assessed. If successful, you receive this message, reversibility was checked, no issue detected. So for those uh, unfamiliar with film, a digitized DPX image sequence has one high resolution image for every film's frame. So a 90 minute film at 24 frames per second has almost 130,000 DPX files within it. This can create a sequence of up to 10 terabytes in size when scanned for 4K distribution. Raw Cook's lossless compression to FFV1 can reduce that overall file size by between one or two thirds on average, which not only saves money, to, um, money on storage solutions, but reduces demands on networks. This is most noticeable when moving files to long-term data tape storage, taking less time to write to and retrieve from LTO libraries. Alongside raw cook, we also use media areas, media info to view and interrogate file metadata. Media info allows you to look at the file metadata in various ways, from basic stream data to a detailed media trace output, which provides binary architecture of a file. We also use MediaConch to create conformance policy um, as an XML file for both DPX and Matroskas, customizing the metadata you want to check in each file. If the metadata is missing or not the correct value, then the validation will fail. All of Media Area's tools are aut automate easily in both Bash shells and Python scripts. So, project. Heritage 2022 project launched in November 2019 when Stephen McConaughey, head of data and digital preservation, wrote the first two bash scripts. The project is managed by Lucy Wales and I joined her team in December that year, a digital preservation data specialist managing these workflows exclusively. At that time, we just held a 10-bit and 16-bit RGB encoding license with Media Area. Any items found not to conform were tar wrapped. In 2020, the scripts expanded to four bash scripts in response to the discovery that the legacy DPX files varied dramatically between suppliers. Media conch conformance checks were added and error checks increased to handle increased breakages in the workflows. 
And then COVID struck and our external agency could no longer retrieve LTO taped items to their isolon masses due to lockdown. The project was paused and I enjoyed some furlough time spent learning Python. In September, I was lucky enough to find myself promoted to my current developer role, but now no longer exclusively responsible for the raw cooked encoding workflows. So in early 2021, I focused my energies refactoring the scripts to make them more self-reliant. Unfortunately, at the same time, there are problems extracting DPX sequences from the LTO data tapes and the Heritage 2022 film digitization project paused its DPX encoding temporarily. And we're currently prioritizing MOV and WAV workflows only. In recent months, the shell scripts have been updated to accommodate our BFI business as usual scanning workflows, adding a new license for 16-bit Luma Y. This also means encoding 4K sequences for the first time. This has required the development of a new Python 3 script to manage DPX folder sizes, as our DPI, uh, digital preservation infrastructure, has an ingest size limit of one terabyte maximum. So let's go through the scripts as they are today. We feel it's really important to share them uh, via our data and digital preservation GitHub pages, as they're built on open software and the ethos of this no time to wait community. This repository is constantly being adjusted as our workflows change. So if you want to try using any of the code, please do so in a safe testing environment first. So there are four bash scripts and two Python scripts used for raw cooked encoding from DPX assessment through to DPX cleanup. Virtually every aspect of the workflows you're about to see is completely free to build and automate using a Linux workstation with media area tools. I'll give you a quick overview of what each one does and follow the order that the scripts acts again, act against each DPX sequence. So DPX assessment. This is a bash shell script indicated by the .sh extension. This script looks in a folder called DPX to assess where all new image sequences are first placed. For each DPX sequence, the script creates metadata of text files to be stored as attachments, then extracts the metadata of the first file and checks to see if it's suitable for raw cooked encoding. Using a media conch policy, it looks for raw cooked minimum specifications, license specifications, and for DPX width and color information. This width and color information is used to separate the sequences into one of diff four different categories, 2K RGB, Luma Y, 4K, or policy fails for tar wrapping. This category detail, DPX sequence path, and total folder size are then passed on to the next script, one sequence at a time. So DPX splitting script. This is a new script written in Python 3. Because of the very large file sizes um, of the 4K files and the maximum DPI ingest of one terabyte, we had to provide a secure method for splitting evenly one DPX sequence across multiple folders. Raw cooked RGB 2K sequences get split into folder sizes 1.3 terabytes in size. Luma Y and 4K are currently set at one terabyte along with the tar wrapping. Once we have more data about encoding Luma Y and 4K, these will get adjusted, but for now we'd rather be safe than sorry. Because we have multi-real folders, for example, 01 of five through to 05 of five, we need a rigid way to make sure that the splits are safe at any point in the sequence range. For example, if 01 of 05 needs four splits and three new folders to hold the divided DPX sequence, then the new real numbers for these sequences become 01 of 08 to 08 of 08. Any subsequent splits increase this further, impacting all sequences within the range. To manage this, a CSV uh, was created and it maps two columns, the original number and the new number, maintaining a strict record of all these changes. Another necessary proportion is that no sequence from a multiple real set can pass through to encoding until all parts are present have been size assessed and renumbered. All multiple real sequences are moved to a part whole split folder only when they're under their required encoding size limit. Finally, we need to map clearly these divisions from our film operation, for, our, for our film operations team who will need to locate these split reels in the future. A text file that is embedded into every Matroska folder, a human readable DPX log allows search of the original DPX sequence number and discovery of its new divisions. 
and the splitting data is also written to our National Archive database in the item record for the DPX sequence. DPX part whole move. This Python script only looks at folders in the part whole split folder. First, it checks to see if the DPX sequence is featured in the CSV's original number column. If that's found there, then it's renumbered to the new number. It then searches for first parts in sequences, for example, 01 of 02 or 01 of 05. It creates a full range from that multi-real as a list through from, from its parts. So that's 01 of 02 to 02 of 02, et cetera. And then it looks for every real um, in the part whole split folder. Only when all parts are found are they all moved onto their encoding paths. If any one real is absent, then a note is added to the log and the script skips that group of reels and then finds it again the next pass. So our encoding script, DPX raw cook. This script is set to run every 15 minutes, but is blocked by Linux flock lock until the active script completes working through its list. So this ensures that the script is running as often as possible without accidentally overlapping and processing the same sequences twice. The script is looking in the raw cooked encoding path, waiting for the completed sequences from the part whole split folder to be moved in for processing. It makes two encoding passes. As you can see, these are essentially identical, but the second has the output version two option instead of the minus S, which is above it. So let's talk through what the flags mean. Raw cook calls the software. Y answers yes to any inquiries that FFmpeg should make, such as shall I ever write this file? Um, the all includes some excellent preservation commands. Uh, these include info, conch, coherency, hash, check or check padding, accept gaps, encode or decode. Of these, the hash command is the most vital in my opinion, as it generates whole file CRC hashes for all the audio visual files in the sequence and stores them in the, in the reversibility data embedded in the Matroska container. Next is no accept gaps. This flag is used to stop gaps passing through without failing the encoding. Accepting gaps is currently a default setting of the all command. Minus S5281680 sets the maximum attachment size limit up to five megabytes, allowing large metadata files to be embedded in the Matroska wrapper. The console outputs of the encoding are directed to a log file named after the Matroska, which you can see being behind the ampersand and the right arrows on the lower line of the command. The second, script is only, the second script is only run when the first script fails because the reversibility data is becoming too large and it uses the output version two flag. So what causes this large reversibility data? So as Jerome mentioned earlier, this problem happens only with certain scanners when usual zero padding bits in each DPX instead have secret data stored inside them. Royal Cook stores this padding data into the reversibility file to ensure perfect reversibility, but this makes the reversibility file too large for FFmpeg to add as an attachment during the encoding. Anything over one gig is too big. The version 21.09 um, was released and this has the fix uh, output version two flag to handle these oversized reversibility files, attaching them after the encoding has finished. So these commands are launched using software GNU Parallel a brilliant open source tool for Linux and Mac that allows multiple script jobs to run concurrently. I definitely recommend you look into it if you're looking to do this type of work. And finally, the logs are output alongside the Matroska file and these are critical to the operation of the next script. DPX post raw cooked. So this script assesses the FFV1 Matroska files and logs to ensure the preservation process has been successful. First, the FFV1 Matroska is compared to a media conch policy, which checks for things like bit rates above 300 megabits a second, FFV1 slices at 16 or above, that the FFV1 Kodak, Kodak has error detection, is lossless, and has intra frame settings. A file that passes this media conch policy may not necessarily pass through to our long term preservation because the second stage assesses the log generated by raw cooked. If error messages reveal a reversibility fault, then the FFV1 files are failed, deleted, and the sequence will be requeued for encoding. If it finds a specific error message about oversized reversibility data, 
it appends the DPX sequence path to the retrial list so that the output version two command is used in the DPX in the DPX raw cooked script, which we just saw earlier. If all is well and the file has been processed fine with no errors, then the FFE one is moved to our automated DPI ingest folder. And the DPX sequence is moved to our DPX completed folder where the final scripts act upon it. DPX cleanup, all very imaginatively named scripts you'll notice. So this final script runs just once a day outside of work hours. It checks DPX completed folder for evidence that each sequence's FFE1 Matroska file has successfully been ingested into DPI. It does this by running a comparison of the file name against ingest logs. If a deleted confirmation is found in the logs, then the original DPX sequence is moved from the DPX completed folder to the deletions folder. In here, the script deletes the folder, which can take quite a long time, hence the movement for the deletion. So that's a quick overview of our current raw cook workflow. With raw cooked FFmpeg and media areas metadata tools, these scripts provide a solid foundation for the creation of open source microservices. And these scripts and workflows are adaptable and maintainable in-house with very few additional costs to us for maintenance or development. These scripts have been written by archivists not formally trained in computer sciences. The, their creation has, made, has been made possible through the expertise and support found in this No Time to Wait community. And I like to think of them as visual proof of the No Time to Wait effect. I also, I also thought it might be interesting to map the evolution of our raw cooked encoding commands based upon problems we've encountered with the variability of these legacy DPX sequences and subsequent patches and snapshots uh, created by Jerome to fix them, some of which he's mentioned. So in 2019, we started our high speed encoding with the, sem with the sim simple command you see here using just raw cooked Y and check flags. Um, and it was encoding with raw cooked version 18.10. Our first problem was discovered soon after launch when some DPX sequences were found to have gaps in them. These gaps appear most frequently in files from one particular supplier where we think a technician consistently removed a few files DPX files from the beginning of each scan folder. Sometimes these gaps would force an error and then the encoding would stop. And sometimes Matroska files would encode with multiple video streams, one for each break in the DPX sequence numbering. To remedy this, uh, Jerome released a new snapshot that allowed gappy sequences to be encoded into a single stream using a new accept gaps flag, which you can see in the center. This works because raw cooked makes a concatenated list of all the DPX files, gaps and all, and this is passed to FFmpeg to construct the Matroska. So in 2020, we encountered unexpected frame rates in the M Matroska files, several presented with incredibly long durations, very low bit rates and a frame rate of 2.5. This was caused by a bug in FFmpeg's algorithm when computing the frame rate and for which Jerome created a workaround in raw cooked. In addition, I noticed there were no frame rates specified in the metadata. Um, if there were no frame rates specified in the metadata, FFmpeg would always default to 25 frames per second. So to remedy this, Jerome's new snapshot saw the introduction of a frame rate flag, which allows users to force a specific frames per second when needed. That year, we also had problems with irregular padding bits. A batch of sequences refused to encode or would fail with a warning that we needed to use the check padding flag. After adding a second pass to our raw cook scripts to encode with this frag, we started receiving different encoding failure messages, including one from FFmpeg. Again, as Jerome mentioned earlier, he discovered that FFmpeg was silently truncating any attachments that were between one gigabyte and two gigabytes in size, which meant the reversibility files were truncated and hence all the error and warning messages. If an attachment was over two gigabytes, the encoding fails completely with a warning message. At this point, we offered sponsorship of a new feature proposed by Jerome that would allow the reversibility data to be appended to the Matroska after, after FFmpeg encoding. So in 2021, we had less DPX throughput and my time was no longer available to frequently quality check the FFV1 Matroska files. Refactoring the scripts or hash finally implemented uh, for the first time so that the check function could be used in place of full reversibility tests. When version 21.01 was released, I updated the DPX raw cook script to incorporate the all command 
along with the no accept gaps flag. Now we have paused encoding our gappy legacy DPX scripts. We'd rather have notification of missing DPX files as a way to quality check BFI sequences and folder movements into the encoding paths. The S flag was added, allowing the attachment sizes to be up to five megabytes in size. Uh, Raw Cooked has an attachment default size of one megabyte. The old command automatically senses if a sequence requires the use of check or check padding now, and also defaults to frame rate 24 when no frame rate metadata can be found in the DPX. So no, neither of those flags are required anymore. As you now know, there's an output version two flag for handling these large reversibility data files by adding the attachments after the encoding was completed. So that was released just this September and Jerome hopes that a future release will see this become part of the all command, removing our need to have two encoding passes in the DPX raw cook script. So what we've learned about encoding. High speed encoding is always desirable, but the development of the hash and check features for version 21.01 supersedes all other encoding commands, as I feel they're so important for long term preservation security. Software like FFmpeg and Raw Cooked has bugs. All softwares do. I recommend conformance checking your Matroska files and keeping an eye on your logs and metadata, and don't be afraid to report anything unusual. I tend to run reversibility tests for every new release now, just to be sure everything is functioning perfectly. At some point, our team plan on implementing a database event tracking um, to follow Raw Cook snapshot version usage to help ensure long-term reversibility. Uh, we'll do this by extracting metadata from the Matroska and importing it into a database's item record. More recently, we've learned that 4K 16-bit encoding really hurts. <laughs> we've just encoded four reels so far, a 64-thread 32-core server with 252 gigabytes of RAM can take between five and 15 hours to encode a 12-minute 4K reel. That's just under one terabyte. This depends on how many other jobs are encoding in parallel. So far, it's uh, been between one and three. You've got two minutes, Joanna. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. 4K and Luma Y coding Matroska reductions seem more variable and generally smaller than previous experience, anything between 5 and 30%. So these tests have very little overscan and no optical audio. So I think we'll see improvements on these figures as we encode a more diverse range of films. 4K max slice counts. Uh, are 576 at the moment, whereas they used to be between 16 and 64 for 2K. Bit rates over 8,000 megabits a second makes these files pretty impossible to play back in anything. And we now need, well, we've always needed it, but we now we really need 24 seven batch encoding is even more critical to ensure that the 4K workflow just keeps, keeps going so that we don't run out of storage. So that's a swift overview. We currently have 2,500 Raw cooked video files ingested into the digital preservation infrastructure. This includes socialism on film from the education and television films collection shown here. Many of these items have optical audio tracks, making them extra mesmerizing to look at. As we predict that the use of raw cook for this 2022 project will save us a total of 1600 terabytes of storage space. By reducing the content storage footprint, we'll ease the burden of future tape migrations. Our projected savings will be in the region of 45,000 pounds for this project alone. Uh, we recently undertook a review of our film scan specification using these findings to inform our suppliers of safe parameters for successful raw cooked encoding. These open source tools are not expensive to implement, but open source doesn't mean free source. Users of these tools need to work together to establish financial support for their long-term sustainability. And as you've seen, the BFI sponsored several features and is currently investigating future developments necessary to our collections, including the potential for raw cooked DCDM encoding. So here's some useful links. Uh, I hope I've illustrated how dependent open source projects are on feedback from users with real world archival use cases and how this feedback is swiftly turned into bug fixes, which in turn improves the product for everyone. So please get involved. I'd like to thank Jerry Martinez for his patience and support during the development of these scripts. Thank the wider community whose blogs, technical guides and cheat sheets continue to aid us in the creation and maintenance of our workflows. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joanna. Um, you've got a lot of compliments also for, for the work you've done and, and of course for your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, Stephen, your colleague, also has some uh, 
uh, uh, comments uh, and, and, and ask, uh, answered some questions in the in the chat. Thank but you, Stephen. Still a few, there are still a few left. So if you have got the time, just to uh, see them over and see if you can answer some of them. But thank you so much for your presentation. No problem. Thank you very much. Well, uh, on this high note, um, we'll take a break for 15 minutes. And uh, so you can leave the Zoom meeting and you can move over to the Gather Town area where you can meet each other for 15 minutes for a cup of tea. And after the break, everybody can come back, of course, in the Zoom meeting. And we will continue with Dave Wright and Ilya Kramer, Ed Summers and Lorena Ramirez-Lopez. So please come back in 15 minutes. Bye bye.